All right, all right. Hello, everybody. Uh, please let me know in the chat room so I can make sure everything is working. Uh, it's good to be back. It's good to start restart the live streams in the channel. I have a lot of people this year that already uh, agreed to talk about bees and their research, and I'm excited about this. Uh, so. Without further ado, I want to go. I have a very today. Today live stream is gonna is is one of the kind of subject that I enjoy talk about. If you follow my videos, you know that I publish uh, several videos about pesticides and, and and the role in how can we deal with pesticides and and honeybee health. And yeah, pesticide is something that got got my attention for a long time and. I really enjoy when I have the opportunity to talk with people that are really working on pesticide research. And today is one of these days. Uh, I have with me today, Dr. Sarah Wood, and she's an associate professor in the Department of Veterinary Pathology at the Western College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of, uh oh, here we go again. Sus, I can't do that. Sus Saskat I can't do that. You, uh, Sarah, you're going to need to help me here. Saskatchewan. All right. Here we go. Say it again. University of Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan. Okay, Saskatchewan. So, sorry, I knew it. Guys, thank you. Thank you very much. I also have Danielle Downey here, the executive director of PAM, Project APSM. They're going to join us with the conver this conversation. Uh, well, guys, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thank you. How are you guys doing? doing Great. Good. Sarah, where are you right now? I am in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada, and we have a lot of snow here. I bet. Danielle, are you talking from where? I'm in South Dakota, and South most Dakota. of our snow has melted in the last few days. Okay. There's still um, some. I'm in Maryland. No, no snow at all. Finally, it's, it's good. <laughs> I, I I'm allergic to to cold. So, <laughs> all right, let's start this because I'm excited about this conversation. So, we, the, what we plan to do is, I'm sure m lots of you guys at home already saw the video that I published about Sarah's research. And so, the way we plan was she gonna give us a, a short presentation about her work and her lab and the other potential other things that she's doing. And then after that, we can start this discussion and figure it out if the fungicides are helping or not, the honeybees. Sarah, uh, we'll put this to the stream. Here we go. Great, thanks so much, Humberto. So you're correct. Today, I'm gonna speak about our group's work to improve honeybee health to ensure sustainable pollination of our blueberry crops. And as Humberto mentioned, I'm located in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada, where I am the research chair in pollinator health. And myself and our team are very interested in improving honeybee health as well as the sustainability of agriculture. And today I'm going to be speaking about research that was funded by Project APIS-M, Costco Canada, the British Columbia Blueberry Council, and MyTax. And in particular, this study focused on investigating uh, the reasons for European fowl brood disease and why it has become more common in colonies pollinating the blueberries. <laughs> So we know that honeybees are extremely important for production of our blueberry crops in North America. And in fact, their pollination services are contributing nearly 90% of the value of those blueberry crops. However, blueberry growers are having a hard time finding enough pollination services to support their crops. And part of the reason that it's hard to find enough colonies to pollinate blueberries is that beekeepers are suffering high overwinter colony losses. So there's just fewer colonies available in the early spring to pollinate blueberries. 
Furthermore, it's very challenging to build up colonies in the early spring, as well as transport them into blueberries where um, they're expected to do their job. So this is a picture of our lab uh, last week, and we are opening up our colonies to treat them for mites. And you can see that there's a lot of snow on the ground here in Saskatchewan. And so it would be logistically very hard for us to not only get these colonies strong enough to be able to pollinate blueberries, um, but as well to transport them to, um, to a blueberry field. So because of that, it can be really stressful on these colonies going into blueberries. And we are aware that European fowl brood is a disease of stress. And so this bacterial disease has become more and more common in colonies pollinating blueberries. And our lab is working to figure out why. So uh, many of you are likely familiar with European fowl brood. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a bacterial disease. And one of the most common signs is a shotgun or patchy brood pattern, as we can see here. This disease is caused by a bacterium known as Melissococcus plutonius, and it infects the colony's open brood or developing larva, resulting in um, ultimately larval starvation and death. So in order to study this disease, we have developed a laboratory model. And so uh, one of our graduate students, Dr. Jenna Tabot, has been working very hard on this model. And what she's able to do is she can infect a newly grafted larva in the laboratory with Melissococcus plutonius. And then she can monitor that larva's survival over time. And so using this model where we infect larva in the lab with bacteria, we had a research question that we wanted to investigate. And specifically, we wanted to know if exposure to fungicides during blueberry pollination could predispose larva to European fowl brood disease. So to answer this question, Jenna used her laboratory model of EFB where she would infect newly hatched larvae with Melissococcus plutonius in the lab, and then she would expose them to environmentally relevant concentrations of fungicides that are used in blueberry pollination, or sorry, in blueberry production, um, over a five-day period. And she would just be exposing these larvae to the fungicides in their diet. And then um, she would then monitor the survival of those larvae over time. And so this is an example of her results, which were recently published in an open access journal that you can, you can access online. And so what we have here is a graph of percent larval survival on the y axis. And then we have time and days on the x axis. And so what you can see is that the larvae that were exposed to the fungicide diet, and this, this diet contained four different fungicides uh, that are used in blueberry production. These larvae had excellent survival. So the fungicide exposed larvae had nearly the same survival as our control larvae that were not exposed to fungicides. So this tells us that these environmentally relevant concentrations of fungicides are not toxic to the larva on their own. Next, Jenna went ahead and infected some larva with Melissococcus plutonius. And so not surprisingly, the survival of these larva was markedly reduced. Less than 50% of these larva survived to be adult bees. But the, interest, the most interesting finding from this experiment was that when Jenna infected the larva with bacteria and then fed those larva the fungicide diet, she saw a significant decrease in their survival. In fact, the fungicide exposed larva had about a 24% decrease in survival 
relative to the larvae that were just infected with the bacteria. So these results would suggest that when larvae are exposed to a combination of four fungicides, that they may be more vulnerable to European fall brood disease. The interesting thing is that when larvae were exposed to one, two, or three fungicides, it seemed that they were not more susceptible to European fowl brood. It was only when the larvae were exposed to four fungicides in combination that we saw a decreased survival from European fowl brood. So really this is a good news story because on their own or in combinations of two or three, we did not see strong effects of fungicide exposure on EFB. It was only the combination of four fungicides that appeared to be concerning. And so if there's good communication between the blueberry grower and the beekeeper, we can potentially avoid the combinations of fungicides that may have negative consequences for bee health. Of course, we need to remember that this was a laboratory study. And so certainly we would need to repeat this at the colony level in order to understand further. And this is our planned next step. I'd like to mention that this research is going to continue. We are planning a five-year cross-Canada study of bee health in blueberry pollination. And we would invite any potential graduate students to contact us uh, if you would be interested in joining our team of bee researchers. So with that, I will uh, pass it over to Humberto. Hello. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for this short introduction. I think it's, it, it's fascinating. Um, I, I think it did, let me, let me tell you what I hear from beekeepers in the field. Um, many of you at home perhaps doesn't know what I do for a living. I'm a private consultant for the beekeeping industry. And uh, every time some beekeepers have problems, my phone rings and we try to figure things out together over the phone or I need to go location or we need to design experiments, private research for commercial beekeepers and all, all this good stuff. Uh, let me change this. Here we go. And so this is one of, one of the, pro the main problems that I got my phone ringing all the time. Uh, especially fungicides in blueberry fields. And I heard a lot of terrible stories. For example, in New Jersey, for example, I was, I was invited to, to, to play around with some problems. Commercial beekeepers in Florida were having a lot of trouble going to the blueberries and they always come back with more than 60, 70% mortality after, after they return from from the blueberries and, uh, and one of the weirdest things that I heard was, for example, uh, and, and beekeepers that I trust, beekeepers that not say anything. There is the thing that I heard from these beekeepers that I trust, that was a common sense was the egg, the, the, the queen lay eggs and the eggs are kind of frozen. They don't develop anymore. H have you ever heard anything about that kind of symptom, Sarah, with fungicides or anything in Canada, similar yeah. situation? I mean, I think uh, you raise a really good point that we need to do more testing of pesticides on the honeybee reproductives, the queens and the drones, because frequently pesticide risk assessment is focusing only on the worker caste. And so these observations like frozen eggs after exposure to fungicides certainly warrant more investigation about honeybee reproductives. What I, what I like about your work is, is that it, it, to me, is a clear example of what, at least what my issues with, with pesticides are. Depending on the combination, you're going to get a result different. In, 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 if I remember correctly, in your, in your graphs, you test one, didn't have anything. You test two, you, you, you help, actually, the, you help the the survivalship of the honeybees 
looks like you were helping. So that's that's a good thing. But when you reach at four, then the bees collapse. So my my understanding, and not only from your uh, article, but from many articles, I, I follow the work of Dr. Reed Johnson in Ohio State, and and I see these all all the time with all kind of pesticides. They're designed for a specific target, but whatever else they have around them that can interact and do some synergistic effect, you can find all kind of scenarios and. And I think this is a problem for the regulatory people. How how can we screen all possibilities to make sure we have something that's not going to hurt not only the honeybees, but whatever else they're doing? I, I really want to ask your thoughts on that because I it's something that I struggle myself with pesticides. Is can we control this beast? Yeah, you're right. There's a lot of combinations. And so you could probably spend a whole career or more studying all the different combinations. I guess one way to think about it is that um, fungicides and pesticides are organized into different classes or different mechanisms of action. So sometimes uh, if you break it down that way into different classes, uh, you can simplify the amount of work that needs to be done in order to uh, effectively screen all potential combinations if you're just screening the different classes. Um, but also I think it speaks to the need to have more versatile testing methods and, and so laboratory models can certainly be um, a nice complement to field studies which are logistically a lot more challenging and expensive. So if we have some quick and easy screening, new laboratory screening tests, that might facilitate a lot more effective risk assessment. The, I, I see the point. I, I see, okay, we have a screening system, but my question is more deep. Can we do it efficiently? And, you know, regarding the bees touch everything and beekeepers try things all the time. And there is always something new in the coming in or a new pollen or, I, I struggle with this thought in my mind, uh, like it is possible for us to guarantee safety of this. And yeah, I, I have this, I, I don't have an answer for that. And my, my gut instincts ask me to, we, uh, to start to think about potential other, other solutions. We might need to go to other solutions, but I, so a lot of my colleagues in the, in the field disagree with me. Oh, but I, I struggle with this question uh, with pesticide use. So what kind of recommendations do you think we can give to, because I like to be very straightforward with beekeepers when we're doing research and, you know, I want to give them answers and it's really hard as a researcher to go to a beekeeper and, and tell them, look, if you do this, you, you're going to have value added to your operation. Oh boy, it is so hard. This is so hard. So how how you deal with that when you go to a beekeeper and he asks you a question, expecting you, the researcher, the guy is going to bring the science to the field to, to, to help them. And I, I, I'm a very, the way I approach it, I says, sir, we need to test a lot in your own operation before I open my mouth because I'm not, it's a very hard, it's very hard to give you a, a, a short answer without no you, your crew, where the water of your, uh, your operation is coming from, you know, there is a lot of variables and the, the, the many, many variables that we have, I think is the biggest challenge for us uh, bee researchers to, to deal with those problems. And, and sometimes a few people are st starting to lose confidence on us. So how you, how you deal with that? <laughs> yeah, I think the biggest lesson that I've learned in the research this far is that communication is absolutely essential. So communication between the beekeeper, between um, the beekeeper, the grower, the blueberry grower, the agronomist, and, and the researcher. Every All the stakeholders need to be at the table and discussing their concerns together. And for our research to be relevant, we had to talk to agronomists to find out what fungicidal products are actually being used in the field and what are the relevant uh, combinations to test. 
And we also had to talk to beekeepers about um, sampling their colonies so that we could use the strains of EFB that are most commonly found in their, in their operations. Uh, and then we had to talk to other honeybee scientists to see what they know and what they've learned so that we can make our research as um, collaborative and relevant as possible. So given the unpredictability of beekeeping and the unpredictability of the environment and the weather, all the things that we can't control, I think the safest solution is to remember that we're all in this together and that, um, you know, there probably is a, a balance that we can achieve between bee health and blueberry health because Everybody wants healthy and productive blueberry crops, and we also need healthy and productive bees in order to achieve those good blueberry crops. So where is the balance? Where is the safe dose range of pesticides that can optimize blueberry health, but also protect our bee health and the pollination services that are so essential to production of those crops? All right. I, I want to hear from Danielle. Danielle, are you still there? I want to bring you in. I want to see what you, you hear from the field because your opinion, you're always in the field too. You deal with a lot of this. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? How can how can we help more and what how Project APSM is addressing this? Well, we fund research. Uh, we're really proud to have funded Sarah for many years. Um, she was our first scholarship award in Canada from Costco. So that was, I don't know what, how many years ago, Sarah, but it's been a great investment. Um, and since then, she's had other projects that we've supported. Uh, Project APSM funds research in the US and Canada. We just passed $10 million and it's about a million in Canada. So funding research that has the potential to deliver solutions for beekeepers is how we help. Um, and I think some of the questions that I would have for Sarah, she did a great job with a very discreet presentation. I'm sure the work has a lot of complex detail, but I'm curious um, if the four fungicides have separate modes of action or if they're similar and what kind of record keeping do pesticide applicators and growers in Canada have to use? Because Reed Johnson's work as an example relies on a lot of really detailed record keeping that California keeps, but most of the rest of the country doesn't have that kind of a resource. How is it in Canada? Yeah, so um, as for the four fungicides that we chose in this study, yes, they all did have different mechanisms of action. And um, again, we selected the ones that were the most commonly used. In terms of um, keeping records about pesticide use. So most growers will have an application calendar where they will record what uh, fungicides went on their crop. And um, oftentimes, you know, with good communication, they're willing to share that information with um, the beekeeper or with us as researchers. Um, in terms of the legal requirement for reporting uh, those that fungicide use, I don't know. Um, but I think the other important thing to remember is that um, we can't control where the bees go. And so even if a beekeeper brought their colonies to one particular field to pollinate, who knows what the growers around are spraying with, what products they might be using. And certainly in the Fraser Valley of British Columbia, I'm told that, you know, there's a lot high density of different fruit growers in a small area. So you know, those bees could be foraging on the fields of several different growers, and that could also present combination exposure to different products. And a follow-up, when the larvae died, did it look like foul brood, or did it just look like a dead larvae? Would there be a way to distinguish this pathology as the crud, or does it look like EFB? Yeah, so again, laboratory models are very controlled and so we have a very specific definition about what constitutes a dead larva and we're only using one strain of EFB although it is a field strain. Um, so we in the laboratory environment yes we know that it looks like EFB what we call EFB in the lab 
but um, I can't say what that would look like in the field. And that's why we do need to do these colony level studies. And so the next phase is uh, to use these same fungicides and feed them to a colony and then infect the larva in that colony with EFB and see if those fungicide exposed colonies would be more likely to have dead larva relative to controls. Okay. So I still have two questions. Should I keep going, Humberto? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so one is about how long you think a fungicide persists in a colony. Like when you see four at one time, what kind of a window of time would that take to actually have those accumulate if they were not all sprayed at one time on the food that the thing ate? Um, and second is a higher level question. We hear some beekeepers say that it's not really, there's not really problems in blueberries, that there are practices that can make it safe for bees. Um, what's your kind of baseline opinion about what's happening when bees go to blueberries health-wise? Yeah. So for the first question about persistence of fungicides, I think that, um, you know, other research teams have looked at pesticide residues in bee bread, for example, from blueberry pollinating colonies, and they do find combinations of different fungicides. So the residues are persistent enough that we can see different fungicides in the same bee bread sample. So I don't think that um, combination exposure is unrealistic. Uh, however, we need to remember that the food that's fed to the larva is processed through those nursing bees. They're not directly fed the bee bread. And so the concentration in the bee bread uh, may be a lot higher than what's actually going to the worker in that worker jelly. So, of course, there's models for us to sort of estimate what that level of transfer is. But, um, yeah, we need to remember that it's not just one to one. What's in the bee bread is getting um, is a realistic larval exposure. Uh, and then the second question regarding sort of what factors impact bee health during blueberry pollination. Uh, it's not just one thing. It's it's multifactorial. And so we often talk about the sort of uh, epidemiologic triad, which is a fancy way of saying that the host, the pathogen, and the environment, all those three things matter when it comes to disease. So the environment where the fungicides are, that's just one factor. We also have to consider the pathogens, so the bacteria itself. There are different strains of this bacteria. Different strains of bacteria may respond differently in different hives. So that's also going to impact whether or not there might be a, a problem in blueberries. And then the third factor, which I think is really important, is the host. So the bee colonies themselves. If a beekeeper is bringing in really healthy, strong colonies, then maybe those colonies are going to be much more resilient to um, EFB or other stressors during blueberry pollination. But if the colonies are weak or they're compromised for some other reason, then yeah, then they may be more vulnerable. So we really need to take a holistic approach, think about all the factors that could be at play. Fungicides are just one small part of the overall picture. Do you think it's possible that what you've identified as an accumulation or as four fungicides make for trouble, is that potentially something that explains what's seen in the field? Uh, that some of these, you know, the colonies that come out of blueberries the hardest, it's because they had that happen? Or is it just a component, you think? I think it's probably just one part of a whole, that there's more than just um, fungicides to explain what's going on. And um, certainly that's why we're continuing this research, to look over time, over space, different beekeepers, different locations, and, and try to get an understanding of some common patterns. I did see a question in the chat about probiotics. Do you know if any kind of probiotics mitigate um, some, some of this? Yeah, so that's a very good question. And uh, we are investigating it. So uh, one of the things that we really wanna look at is actually propolis because we know mm -hmm. that propolis is antibacterial on its own. We know colonies collect it. 
and could that be a potential treatment for EFB? And so we have um, this versatile model that we can test. We can give them propolis and then infect them and see what happens. Um, but there's, yeah, other lactobacillus species have been used as potential uh, alternative treatments. There's some other plant-based products that are sold on the market uh, that we could test. So we're absolutely interested in addressing that question. I feel that we are missing a good component in this discussion. And I'm going to make an invitation here. Let's see what happens. Where is the Canadian beekeepers blog? I want you here. Are you still there? I would love to 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 have your thoughts here with us. If you if you can, if you want to jump in, I can send you the the link. Just let me know. So, but continue this discussion. I want from a guy that is always in the field dealing with the beekeepers. I I I, I think I need to mention something that I faced. It was problematic. It is to find out what is true. Like the farmers are. Took me forever to convince the farmer to tell exactly what he was spraying, and, and, and sometimes took me forever to get what the beekeepers were using in the hive or the management systems. There is always some sort of secrets, and it is fine. You know, I understand both parts. So everybody wants to protect their own operation, their own business model, and it's hard to trust people sometimes. But the only way. For, for a researcher to do their, their job is to, to know the facts. If you start with the wrong fact, it's gonna be wrong at the end. There is no way around that. So just a, a message that perhaps we need to find ways to start to communicate and better and, and really share. And there is some level of trust because there is no research that can be done if you start with the wrong fact. It's gonna, it's gonna end up in with the wrong answers. That's a fact. Yeah, garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right, so let's see here with some questions. If you guys have questions, now is the time to ask Sarah this <laughs> Sarah do you know how uh, blueberry growers apply fungicides or how often or what they're yeah what, what's the protocol in Canada yeah I don't have a lot of knowledge about it to be honest um I am planning a trip to blueberries this spring in to highbush blueberries, and so I'm hoping to learn more about it. Because um, I am in Saskatchewan, we don't have a lot of blueberry production where I am, um, and so I'll be visiting to start to learn about that. And then um, it's also important to remember that we have highbush blueberries on the west coast, but we have lowbush blueberries on the east coast of Canada, and that production system is completely different, different species, totally different management. And um, so to compare and understand the differences and similarities is uh, definitely a goal of our team. And I know for some time there was communication between the researchers studying blueberry pollination and bee health on the West Coast and the East Coast and in Michigan uh, and on both sides of the border in the Canada and U.S. research communities. Does that still happen? Yeah. Um, so we did recently have a symposium on European fowl brood at the Entomological Society of America meeting, which was held in Vancouver this past fall. And so we had researchers there from Oregon, from Michigan, from Canada, um, as well as from uh, the UK and Japan, everybody discussing European fowl brood and frequently in the context of blueberry pollination. And so that's really, I think, where we can get some progress when people start talking about their experiences, their research and uh, opportunities for collaboration. And my understanding is that there's a, a shortage of beekeepers willing to pollinate blueberries. And in BC, I've seen the number 30,000 colonies are needed to to achieve the pollination that the blueberry growers would like. 
I know on the east coast of Canada, there's also more blueberries than they have bees to pollinate. Um, is that your experience as well? Do you know much about that? Yeah, so just talking to beekeepers, I hear that, um, of course, you know, they might like to see higher prices for those colonies that could potentially increase the supply. Um, but uh, that it's really hard when the price of honey is very strong to justify taking those colonies to pollination and potentially having them come out weaker and producing less honey. You know, there's sort of a cost benefit that those beekeepers have to make the equation. Is it worth it to take them to pollination? And is the compensation for that pollination going to cover the potential loss in honey production later in the season? And so beekeepers are businessmen, they have to worry about their bottom line and they also have to worry about the health of their colonies. And um, I can understand why they might be reluctant to go. And then on the other hand, I understand why it must be frustrating and difficult for the blueberry grower, right? They um, also have a, a bottom line and you know they're exquisitely reliant on those pollination services. So I think that's why we need more communication, people talking to each other and understanding that, you know, we're really in the same boat. Uh, we want the best for for our crops and our bees. All right, I have some questions here. What about the synergistic effect of other chemistry encounter in the real world? Have you thought about this? I think it's related with my comments at the, at the beginning. My, I always how can we monitor all the potential combination of everything that is going inside the hive, outside the hive, in the water? It's a good question. And I guess my answer is that um, in this particular study, we tested formulated fungicidal products. So we didn't just test the active ingredients, we tested the products that are actually being sprayed on the fields. And so those products contain adjuvants, they contain proprietary ingredients, uh, so there really is a mixture of things that we're not fully understanding or fully knowledgeable of what the ingredient list is. Um, but it was important to us to use the exact product that's being used in the field because you're right, there could be other adjuvants or other ingredients that impact how those fungicides are going to affect the bees. All right. Another one. Are the blueberry growers using four fungicides at one time or just one at a time? I think. Yeah, so I couldn't really speak to that, but I do know that, for example, some of the products that we tested had two fungicides in the same product, right? So certainly there's products that have multiple fungicides in them. Um, and so when growers are doing tank mixes uh, of certain chemistries according to the agronomist um, recommendations, certainly there's opportunity for mixtures. Whether there's four at one time, that I don't know, but um, I do know that, you know, as we discussed, when residues accumulate in bee bread, that's where we could certainly see multiple residues in the same sample. And then also remembering that bees could forage on multiple different treated crops at the same time. And so again, acquire, encounter combinations of fungicides in the environment. And there's a question about whether fungicides can be applied during bloom. And I think in many cases they can. I think you're right. Um, but I think too, right? Oftentimes growers will communicate with that pollinator beekeeper pollinating beekeeper and maybe spray at times where the bees are less likely to be out foraging. So uh, I think there is some consideration to that. Yeah, I, from my experience with some gentlemen, I can guarantee you we, we could, we can find combinations from three, sometimes four different pesticides at the, the same time. Right, um, George is asking about sterile inhibitors creating a nutritional stress for honeybees. Are you familiar with that work? Um, not so much, um, but certainly nutritional stress uh, is absolutely a big player during blueberry pollination. And, you know, if the bees aren't getting adequate nutrition through pollen, um, that could certainly impact their vulnerability to pesticide exposure and, and might immunosuppress them. 
So sterol inhibitors are an active ingredient at, in a, a fungicide, and they actually also prohibit some of the digestion of uh, nutrition for the bees. And that's work from Priya Chakrabarty and Ramesh at Oregon State, if anybody wants to see that. Great. Yeah, I know they're an excellent team. So um, that's good work. I see Megan Melbrath is here too, another blueberry pollination researcher. That's good. Hi, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, will you be adding BVT's biological bee delivery fungicide, CR7, to your testing? I don't have any immediate plans, but um, certainly if it's something that growers are using and bees are encountering, then I'm absolutely open to uh, learning more about it. Yeah, I don't, I'm not familiar with that. I, I know what it is, but I don't have a personal experience to anything to share with that. Yes, interesting question. Do honeybees suffer from mitochondrial decline and would that have a relationship with EFB. Sarah, do you know anything about mitochondria and EFB? In I, I don't. I need an education here, but that's why I'm here <laughs> to learn from you. Yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't know much about that too. I'm sorry, Carmi. <clears throat> right. Is there evidence of this? affecting backyard beekeepers close to blueberry farms or is this directly pollination crews? I guess most of yeah. my uh, investigation has been with pollinating blueberry um, colonies. I don't know as much about the effects for hobbyists, um, but yeah, certainly if they are nearby a blueberry field, there's no reason that their bees uh, might not be foraging on uh, blueberries, yep, and being exposed. Sarah, do you know the um, recommended stocking density for hives and blueberries? Yeah, I want to say, um, what is it, two colonies per acre, but um, I think oftentimes they're not able to meet optimal stocking density because they just don't have enough. And do you know, I, I know you're, you've been studying EFB for a while. What would be the proximity of EFB that you would expect to spread? Is that predictable? Well, I don't know about spread, but I mean, sometimes like, um, I do hear that EFB is not necessarily a problem right during blueberry pollination, but it's after. So like four weeks after they all of a sudden see this spike. Um, so, you know, that's, I guess, interesting too, is that um, it's, there's maybe a bit of a time delay before beekeepers are seeing a problem. Yeah. And one of the comments says they see EFB a couple of weeks before blueberries. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and again, it's a disease of early spring, yeah? Usually when there's that imbalance in brood to, to nursing bees, not enough of those adult bees to be looking after the colonies, rapidly developing population of brood. So um, anytime in the early spring, I think there's always going to be a risk. Yeah. I think another thing that American beekeepers are now starting to realize, especially with the discussion about opening the border for packages, and the very severe winter losses in Canada, um, the Canadians don't have the same access to replenish and recover in a season uh, as, as a, you know, the U.S. beekeepers will split and rebuild. And that's not as readily available an option in Canada. Is that? It's true. Yeah. Yet, um, because you're right, like we really we're reliant oftentimes on imported queens because you know, we just don't have, um, can't produce queens early in the season. Um, and so we're not as resilient to rebound from a loss. Um, but, uh, you know, there's other advantages, right? We have a brood break because of our winter. So maybe we have lower varroa. So, uh, you know, the glass is always half full in some ways. I know, but even with low varroa, you're having to go out and treat in the snow. That's amazing. Yeah, that's 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 Danielle. <laughs> All right. So great discussion. Thank you, uh, Sarah. What are the four fungicides of the, yeah. the 
So the trade names of the products are Captain, Kenja, Luna, and Switch. Those are the trade names. All right. Next question. Is there not regulations for blueberry crops not to spray while the plant is in flower? I know in Quebec that apple orchard cannot be sprayed while in flower. Not familiar with blueberries though. What's the regulation? Do you know the regulation? And uh, because there is also the regulation and there is what happens for real. Well, I can say that um, it depends on the risk assessment for that compound and a lot of fungicides. So for insecticides, if you're spraying apples for the moth, the coddling moth or something, that's going to probably be very clearly toxic to bees. And so then it would be restricted from being sprayed while bees could be there on flowers. But fungicides are often considered bee safe. You know, they and and in fact, some of your data, Sarah, shows that there's not really a, a mortality associated with the, the larvae eating them until they eat four. <laughs> yeah. So then those ones would probably be allowed to be sprayed if they're not shown to have a toxicity effect on the bees. Okay, let's continue here. Uh, I think we already addressed George Henson. John Jabot says stocking density varies depending on the age of the plants and the variety, but two to six colonies per acre with an average of three. Okay, if the grower spread the fungicide in the evening without the bees flying, does the fungicide disappear by the morning? I think we cover a little bit about that, how, how fast the pesticide goes away. Yeah, I think there's still a potential route for exposure, even if the bees aren't flying. Do you know about the, um, the pollen and nectar production of the blueberry flowers? So is the pollen just certain times a day and how long is it available? And Yeah, no, I have no knowledge of it at all. But yeah, the important, the biology of the plant is really important into if we're gonna understand what the route of exposure is, yep. Mm -hmm. I know we, we have uh, bees in cover crops and I talk to beekeepers who say cut the cover crops, the bees know when the the good stuff is available and they go to that and exhaust it. And then they'll go to the things that are second best and third best consecutively. And there are plants that only offer nectar and pollen at certain conditions or times of day. So all of that complicates the exposure and accumulation and when it would be picked up by the bees. So it's not just to avoid hitting them when they're flying. If you're thinking about when it gets on pollen. Yeah, absolutely. One more question here, I think, but I have. Wouldn't the FDA after blueberry pollination lean towards sterile in inhibitors? I'm not familiar with that. Anyone? Yeah, I think that we'd have to look up when that particular compound is applied. Yeah. I mean, if maybe this person knows it's to protect fruit rather than prevent problems before the fruit's on so so okay so what's the the big message here then after we complete a study like that i always always i'm gonna hear that a lot in the field and so I, I, i'll ask you guys what's the big message here i think the message is that um combinations can be trouble so we need to know what the residues are in bee bread in colonies that are pollinating blueberries. And if those residues are falling into combinations of four, then we should be concerned. The other message is that I don't think fungicides on their own are a driver or an explanation for EFB in blueberries. There are many other host and pathogen and environment factors that can result in a perfect storm for EFB. So it's not so simple to just point the finger at fungicides. 
And I guess the third and final message would be communication. Communication between the beekeeper and the grower and the scientists is the way forward. I also have to say, Humberto, shamelessly, um, the long game is to support research, to answer these questions. There's there's always more questions than there are answers. And so if you want to support applied beekeeping research, you can give money to Pam and we'll put it into projects like Sarah's. Sounds a plan. Hey, I, I forgot something here. Here we go. Oh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah. I'm curious oh. if, if anybody in the chat can tell me how long are bees usually in blueberries? Or maybe you know, Sarah. I don't know yeah. that. So it's usually about um, a month for high bush. My understanding is they go in here around April 20th and then they're going to come out at the end of May. That's a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Julia Coleman said one month too. So yeah, but I want to reemphasize that part of the communication because this is one of the my my main issues in the field. We go to a place, we start the relationships, we develop the relationships, we gather all the information we get, and we start conversation, design experiment to help, and then when everything is already in place, there is a new information from the beekeeper or the farmer. Oh, but I forgot to mention, and so uh, then everything was. It's, it's really frustrating because there are ways. You have a lot of information like this uh, uh, project and this. So we have a lot of information in the literature and we can, we can put things together, but we need to know what's going on. Otherwise, it's impossible. Megan, do you have some remarks? I know you there. <laughs> she answered my question about how long bees are yeah berries. and i think it's great um sarah thank you for yeah. coming on i think at pam we really we support a lot of research but we realized the we need to close that circle and give the information back to the beekeeping community and so doing things like this helps get the information out there and humberto thank you too for this platform and helping us share current findings and research. I think that's my really pleasure. I, I like this collaboration very much and I'm looking forward for more things, more good projects like that. So I can cover from Pam. So let's see we what's have the a next lot of projects. I know. I know <laughs> that's yeah. Good. Thanks to you both for this opportunity and yeah, special thanks to Pam because without the funding from Pam, but also the network of researchers that was connected to me through Pam, I would not be where I am today. And so I can really credit Pam for uh, supporting me, not only as a student, but also as a researcher. So thank yes. you. Yes. All now right. That's a honeybee chair. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. great. That's yeah. True. Yeah. Good. Like Good. I said, great investment. <laughs> I'm doing yeah, my best. Yeah. Your best All is great. Right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you at home for stopping by and support the channel, support Pam, support the research community and everything that's happening around us. So we're trying our best to, to bring answers and, and, and do everything we can. So and we depend on you at home to support this whole process that we're doing here. So thank you for, for watching. And I'll see you guys in the next video inside the Hive.TV, the show about bees. See you guys next week.